So hi everybody, um, I'm Alexander Radovic. I am an assistant professor at the Polytechnic University in Bucharest in Romania. Um, my colleague here is one of my ex-students, now a senior student at the same university and an under undergraduate TA. Um, and he has more than six years experience in teaching and using Linux. Um, my main job at the Polytechnic University is to teach computer science in the computer engineering department, mostly um, Linux uh, operating systems and programming. A thought that has been bothering uh, my group for several years is that computer science is kind of becoming like mathematics. Um, it's not only an own science, but it's distributed in every other field that you can find, from fine arts to mechanical engineering to power engineering and all the fields that you can imagine. The same way that we use math, we will use computer science for these fields. And the question that has been bugging us for years is how do we teach this computer science or the necessary knowledge of computer science to these other fields? Um, so in the future, everybody will need something from computer science. It doesn't matter if it's a car, mechanics on the car, or the electrics on the car, if it's an artwork or a robot that moves, or it's an automation installation. The engineers and the builders of those devices will have to have some basic knowledge of how algorithms work and how software for devices work. Um, so some minimal basic knowledge for these things. Uh, and this is difficult. And I will ask Alex, which studied programming devices, to share your, his knowledge, his experience for this. In the third year at our university, we have a subject at which we have to build and program a microcontroller. So after two years of uh, learning uh, programming and uh, advanced operating systems, uh, we have to create a project for, for this board. Um, it took us several days to, to actually achieve this. So on Linux and Mac, after a few tries, it worked. For Windows, it was even harder. Uh, so it is quite easy to understand why for most of my colleagues, this wasn't a favorite subject. Now let's take a moment to imagine how this would have been for students with no computer science background. I mean, uh, having to uh, write embedded C code and use advanced Linux commands in order to write the program on the board would have been next to impossible. So to tackle this, um, 10 years ago in Italy, we had a project that you know as Arduino. Researchers at that project decided to teach the usage of computer science of, and basic programming to people that had nothing to do with it, like fine artists and people that did electrical engineering or just people that would tinker. And this project is known today as Arduino. What they actually did is they, they took the CPU or the microcontroller that was most used in devices, put it on an embedded board for education, and built a really easy to connect device. It, you didn't need any programmer anymore. You didn't need a special cable. All you had to do is buy a USB cable. They built a really easy um, program to write software for the Arduino. It's the Arduino IDE. From a computer science perspective, it's a really bad program, like really simple, doesn't have code completion. It's Neanderthal technology. But for somebody that does not do programming every day, it was perfect. One window, copy paste some code, modify a little bit, run it on the microcontroller, and it worked. And this is why we have Arduino today, and it's used in IoT so much. The problem with Arduino is that it's limited to devices. If we want to connect it, well, we can, but it's not advised. So we can add a Wi-Fi shield or an Ethernet shield, but security is bad over there. Second, if we want to interact with the internet, the C programming language is a really big barrier. So um, Arduino is not that great for connectivity. So what about connected devices? We have the Raspberry Pi. This appeared somewhere in 2012. Um, and it's really easy to use if you use it as a computer. That means you plug in a screen and the keyboard and start writing some code. It's super for kids. It's super for people that want to write a little bit of code, but 
they use it as a normal computer. It's not a device. And the second problem that it has, there's so many languages that you can use, so many examples, and if you need to hook two of those examples together, it becomes a mess. So if you want to build a robot or a device or something that sits on a rooftop, we can't connect the screen and the keyboard. And this is a problem. So transferring software to the Raspberry Pi becomes increasingly difficult. Students need to know SSH, need to know networking, need to understand an IP address, and some Linux commands. And again, Alex will share his experience at one of our programs where we did teach the Raspberry Pi this way. Yeah, actually, in the ninth grade, I was part of an, uh, of an IoT training. Uh, it was my first contact with embedded systems. And it was pretty hard. Like, we had to find out the IPs of the, of the boards. We had either to scan the, the networks for, for the IP, either connect a, an HDMI cable and a monitor to find out the IP. The boards kept changing the IPs. It was really hard. Um, and for most of my colleagues, which were high school students, it was their first contact with a Linux terminal. It was the first time they have seen a Linux terminal at that time. Uh, and another fact uh, that we were really scared of as people with no computer science background was connecting the sensors. We were really afraid of frying things. So for computer science engineers, programming the Raspberry Pi is really easy. Um, we talked to several universities. They all said, oh, yeah, it's easy. We just SSH into it, write some code. But that's computer scientists. That means people that dream of this guy or this guy every day. But people that are not computer scientists, they have a serious problem in using the Raspberry Pi. So myself, I kept it on a shelf for a year because it was not clear. Use it as a computer, use it as a device. For a device, OK, how do you write code for it? So inspired by the Arduino example, we built while in Studio. This is a really simple user interface, it, a really simple IDE. Um, for computer scientists, it's too basic, like just write some code. But for people that are not in computer science, they write a few lines of code, click a button, the program goes to the Raspberry Pi and it's executed. It's not just for the Raspberry Pi, it can be used for any embedded device. The most important thing that we learned in using this software was the one click run. So if they can write a program and click a button and run it, students are super happy. If they have to SSH, have to copy the program, install libraries, run it manually, computer science students do it. Um, others don't. We encourage them to use Python, as the Raspberry Pi Foundation does this. And also, we adapted Blockly, Google Blockly, um, to write Python code for them. This has been particularly useful for students that had the first contact with the Raspberry Pi. So, when they start building more complex programs, Python is fine. But for the first contact, this was great. They would just drag some blocks, hit a run, oh, it works. Um, they could also see the Python code on the side. Um, what we found out in six years of trying this piece of software and teaching IoT to several fields is that there's three categories of knowledge that they need. Um, one is software for devices, so minimum programming skills, minimum algorithmic skills, like if, else, something like that. Connectivity, this means how to connect devices to the network, to Bluetooth, and how to connect sensors and peripherals to devices. And this is something that we learned the hard way, some basic security measures. Most important, change the default password. Like, it took we had a hackathon, and we hooked up some Raspberry Pis, never bothered to change the default password. We got hacked in five minutes, I think. Yeah. Five yeah. minutes after connecting them to the internet, we got hacked. Like, Pis were completely deleted, um, new software was running on them and trying to infect others. So basic security measures, like change the password, stop the SSH if it's not necessary. This is super important for students that are not in computer science. Um, on the connectivity side, um, Alex can share you another story. <laughs> uh, one thing that the students loved about using the, the Wilder Dream Studio was the fact that you could, uh, you could uh, see in the interface listed all the devices, like the IP address. And another fact is that you can change, you can set a name for the Raspberry Pi, so that if the 
IP address changes, because it happens, you can still find out which Raspberry Pi is yours. Because if you have a larger course, and you have at least, I don't know, 15 or 20 Raspberry Pis connected, having no way to identify which Raspberry Pi is yours, it's a nightmare. And also, uh, another thing that the students loved is that the fact that they can use visual code, like visual programming. Because if they have no background on uh, writing code, it really helps them. Um, having the software deployment issue solved, um, another issue that we had was connecting sensors. I cannot tell you how many sensors we fried, mostly for by polarity inversion. They just hooked them up in the wrong way. So what we ended up doing, uh, I mean, if you have one student, it's fine, but if you have 20 or 30 students in a class, it becomes difficult. We did a board like this. So we used the Raspberry Pi, did an extension board with some Grove connectors. Um, it is impossible to hook them up in the wrong way. So for students that were not accustomed to electronics, this was super. I mean, they would just plug in cables. They could not put it in the wrong way. Sensors would just work. So this was great. Besides that, we, printed, we 3D printed some um, objects, like a stop sign, or a house, or a windmill, so that students could have a feeling of what they're doing, not just some sensors hooked up with cables and, OK, this is a house, but actually, it's not a house. Um, and they were really, really great for the energetic uh, students' uh, yeah. courses. Um, another story that we have was building a lab. So scaling from three students to 20 students or 100 students is super difficult. Uh, one is the problem that Alex said. It was difficult to find out the pies. Second, it was difficult because students were kept installing pro uh, software on the Pi. Uh, we had to use the pies for several courses. So what we started doing is a boot server. Finally, the Raspberry Pi knows how to boot from a network. So we designed a boot server that was serving the image for the, each Raspberry Pi. Teachers were able to pre-install a package of programs, put it on the server. Students would just come with Wilder in Studio, connect to a Pi, and the programs were mounted on the Pi. So we did this with a lab with, of 20 students, and it worked great. Like, we reduced the time from starting the lab from 45 minutes to about three minutes. Um, so this is the board that we designed. We made it for power engineering students, students that learn about nuclear power plants, hydropower plants, electric power generation and transmission. They don't learn computer science. What they used to do before having this lab, they would program some microcontrollers. It was hell for them. I mean, nobody wanted the class. They were not dropping out because they can't. They have to take the class. But it was not their favorite. After using the boards, the 3D prints, Wildudin Studio, and the visual environment, um, most of the students said it was one of their favorite classes because it was the first class where they saw they can build something. And even if it's, this device is not something that they will use in the industry, the principles are the same. Because power engineering students don't need to code, but need to have a basic understanding of coding need to be able to modify some PLCs and some code on some PLCs. Um, because it was so successful, um, the first iteration of Wilder Studio was built kind of organic, like we need to add this, and then we need to add this, and OK, let's say, what about this one? And it became a spaghetti code. So we made a new version of the Wilder Studio, which is the same easy to use IDE. It's focused for IoT. so connecting two devices, hooking up devices, and it's easily, easy to extend. It's basically a collection of plugins. Um, adding a new device or a new board is super easy. Um, for the moment, these, is, these are the boards that we almost already support. Um, the application comes in two flavors, either a local application, either a web application. Uh, this was funny. We started with the web application because it was easier for students. They didn't have to install anything. And then we did some trainings in Germany, like five years ago. And we found out it's illegal for students to have accounts on a third-party server, mostly for high school students. So what we had to do, we had to somehow make a local application. So that's why we have the local application. You just download it, it stores your projects locally, Everything is fine. For the web application, it's still easier to use a web application. 
we have a new principle. We store it in your local storage. So none of your data goes to the servers. Everything is locally stored. Um, it's fully GDPR compliant, which in Europe is a big, big issue. And um, yeah, no account, no name, just use it in the browser. Um, we support most of the browsers that you have today. Um, it's open source, it's free. Uh, it's written in JavaScript, mostly for Electron or for the browser. Um, but we need your help. Uh, I mean, it's an open source project, so we would love to have more contributors to it. Um, we're hoping to have the code better documented than the first version and be built it in, ex in an extensible way. Um, we would love to have more translators. I mean, we have about seven languages that we translated in, but we need more because for students, it's super important to have it in their own language. And of course, because it's a free project, we are looking for sponsors. Uh, I mean, we do this in our free time and it would be great if we could actually do it more professionally. Um, thank you very much. Um, that's the website, um, that's the GitHub repository, and we have a technical showcase at 5 p.m. where you can actually try it out. Um, if you have any questions. <laughs> well, thank you.